Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and this is 2C November 2023 of the Pearson and Excel International uh, GCSE. Uh, let us take a look at the questions and discuss the answers. So the first question here said, this question is about group 7, the halogens. What is the total number of electrons in one fluorine atom? Of course, in order to answer this question, we look at the periodic table. We know that the periodic table shows the elements with two numbers. The bigger number is the mass number or atomic mass. And this is the number of protons plus neutrons. The smaller number, which is the atomic number, now that is the number of protons and the number of total electrons the total number of electrons in fluorine is nine electrons what is the charge on a bromide ion so if we look again at the periodic table bromine is in group seven so it has seven electrons in its outermost shell and that means it needs to do what to have a full outer shell an element has full outer shell if it has eight. So if it has seven, it needs to gain an electron. If it gains an electron, that means it has an extra negative charge. So its charge would be one minus or minus one. Which of these describes the element iodine at room temperature? You are required to know that group 7, you need to know as we go down, the color gets darker. So we go from yellow to green to reddish brown to gray to black. And the states go from gas, gas, liquid, solid. So if we look at iodine, iodine is a gray salt. Then this question says, when a halogen is added to a solution containing halide ions, a displacement reaction might, may occur. Uh, this uh, table shows the results of reaction between chlorine and something bromide, chlorine and something iodide, and so on. You should know, basically, that going down group 7, the one at the top is more reactive than anything below it. So fluorine is the most reactive halogen, and that means it will be able to displace any halogen below it. So chlorine can displace bromine, and that is why when we react chlorine with bromide or iodide, there is a reaction. This is because chlorine is more reactive than bromine and iodine, so it displaces them. Now, what about bromine? Bromine cannot react with something chloride. Bromine is less reactive than chlorine, so it will not displace it. But it is more reactive than iodine, so it can displace iodine. Now, iodine is the least reactive in that list. It is less reactive than chlorine and bromine, so it cannot displace them. So we cannot say iodine plus potassium chloride, for example, iodine plus potassium bromide, no reaction, because iodine is less reactive. It would not displace chlorine or bromine. Question 2 says, this question is about gases in the atmosphere. A teacher uses this apparatus to determine the percentage of oxygen in air. The teacher removes the stopper, ignites the magnesium ribbon, and immediately replaces the stopper. The magnesium reacts with oxygen to form magnesium oxide. During the reaction, the water level in the bell jar rises. When the flame goes out, some magnesium remains in the basin. The first question is, give the appearance of magnesium oxide. So what is happening here? We have magnesium. We are burning it in air. So of course, it's reacting with 
oxygen in the air and when it reacts it forms magnesium oxide now what is the appearance of magnesium oxide you should remember that magnesium oxide is a white ash or a white solid give a chemical equation for the reaction of magnesium and oxygen i'm going to remind you chemical equation means it has to be simple and balanced so let's write magnesium is mg oxygen you have to know is diatomic and that means if it is standing alone it is written as o2 or the molecule is made up of two atoms now this gives what magnesium oxide how do we write magnesium oxide remember the valencies valency of magnesium this is in group two so valency two it should go under the oxygen but then also the oxygen has a valency of two and that is why we do not put twos under any of them so this is the formulas have we finished we need to balance so how many oxygens before the arrow two that means i need two oxygens after the arrow and that means now i have two magnesiums so i need two magnesiums before the arrow so this is the balanced equation explain why the water in the bell jar rises now we said magnesium is reacting with the oxygen in the air that means it's taking oxygen from the air and that means the water goes up to replace the oxygen used up in the reaction with magnesium The volume of air in the bell jar at the start of the reaction is 2,000 centimeter cubed. So total air in the bell jar is 2,000 centimeter cubed. Now when the reaction ends, the apparatus cools down to room temperature. Calculate the expected volume of gas in the bell jar at room temperature. So remember what are we taking from the air we're taking oxygen how much of the air is oxygen you should know that oxygen is 21 percent of the air and that means after we have taken all the oxygen we're left with 79 percent of what we started with so 79 percent of what we started with is 1580 centimeter cube state why the gas remaining in the bell jar at the end of the reaction is approximately 99 percent nitrogen why isn't it 100 percent nitrogen if we've taken all the oxygen why isn't everything left nitrogen well that's because the air is not only made of nitrogen and oxygen if we've used up all the oxygen we still have 0.9 percent argon and about 0.04 percent carbon dioxide this question is about aluminium state why aluminium cannot be extracted by heating aluminium oxide with carbon remember if we want to extract aluminium or if we want to extract any metal we have one of two methods either we're going to use electrolysis or we're going to use reduction with carbon when do we use electrolysis we use electrolysis if the metal is more reactive than carbon so any metal above carbon in the electrochemical or reactivity series we will need to do electrolysis because it is more reactive than carbon and cannot be displaced by it so I cannot say aluminium oxide plus carbon. It will not work. Carbon is less reactive. It will not displace aluminium. Aluminium is a metal with many uses. Aluminium is malleable, good conductor of heat and electricity, has low density compared to most other metals. Explain two uses of aluminium that are related to its properties so you have to mention a use and which property are we using it for so for example what do we use aluminium for 
We use it to make aircraft bodies. Why do we use it to make aircraft bodies? Because it has low density. Remember to use one of the, those mentioned in the list at the beginning of the question. What else? We need another use. We can say food containers because it's malleable and good conductor of heat. Or you could say overhead cables because it has low density and good conductor of electricity. The diagram represents the structure of pure aluminium and the structure of an alloy of aluminium. Use the diagram to explain why the alloy is harder than the pure aluminium. And we have three marks and that means we have to explain the pure aluminium and the alloy. Now, for a pure metal, you should remember the layers of positive ions can slide over each other when heated or hammered, and that is why we said it is malleable. But the alloy is harder. It cannot do this easily. This is because atoms of different sizes do not allow the layers to slide over each other easily. So remember, Alloys are harder than the pure metals because atoms of different sizes do not allow the layers to slide over each other easily. Question 4 says a student uses this method to investigate the reaction between sodium hydroxide and dilute hydrochloric acid. So, pour 25 centimeter cubed of dilute hydrochloric acid into a glass beaker. Measure the temperature of the acid. Add 5 cm cubed of sodium hydroxide solution and stir the mixture. Record the highest temperature reached. Continue to add 5 cm cubed portions of sodium hydroxide solution until a total of 40 cm cubed has been added. Record the temperature after adding each 5 cm cubed portion of sodium hydroxide. So basically, we had 25 centimeter cubed of acid in the beaker. And then we're adding 5 centimeter cubed sodium hydroxide and measure the temperatures. And another 5 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide and measure the temperature and so on. Now state two factors that the student must keep constant to make this a valid investigation. Okay, we already have that we're putting a certain amount of hydrochloric acid and we're putting portions of sodium hydroxide solution what should be the same each time well the sodium hydroxide solution we're adding should be the same concentration each time and it should start with the same temperature each time you add five centimeter cubed of the base Explain how using a polystyrene cup instead of a glass beaker would increase the accuracy of the results. Remember, when we are doing an experiment in which we're measuring temperature, we should do it in polystyrene cup, not a glass beaker. Why? We should know polystyrene is an insulator, so there is less loss of heat to the surroundings, so the temperature change measured would be more accurate. The graph shows the student's results. Use the graph to determine the maximum temperature change. Well, obviously the temperature is increasing from zero until what? Where is the highest? Temperature change, well, that's where both uh, lines meet, and that is at about 32.5 degrees Celsius. Explain the shape of the graph. What is happening here? Obviously, as we add sodium hydroxide, the temperature rises. This is because the sodium hydroxide reacts. It's an exothermic reaction. The temperature rises. We add some more sodium hydroxide, more reaction, more temperature rise. Until what? At some point, it's not going up anymore. This is when all acid has been used up. And then after that, 
if we add any more sodium hydroxide, so when we added more than 20 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide, then this causes the reaction mixture to cool down because there is no more reaction and the temperature goes down. The student repeats the experiment using a polystyrene cup and these are the results. Calculate the heat energy change in kilojoules. How do we get Q? You should know Q is mc delta t. What is m? Remember m is the total mass of solution. So what do we have in the solution? We have 25 centimeter cubed of HCl and 22 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide. So the total would be the M times the C, which is 4.2, times the delta T, which is the temperature change, and that is 35. This gives Q in joules. We are required to get it in kilojoules. That means divide by a thousand. This question is about carboxylic acids and esters. Ethanoic acid reacts with magnesium to form two products. Complete the equation for this reaction. So usually when we write equation, we write the structural formula. So you should know that ethanoic acid is something that has two carbons and the last carbon has COOH, so ethanoic is CH3COOH, plus magnesium. Now, this is an acid plus metal. Acid plus metal would give the salt plus hydrogen gas. And, of course, to balance, we need two in front of the ethanoic acid. Then, this is a reaction in which I'm putting a metal into acid and it is giving hydrogen gas. So what are the observations that could be made? If I put a metal in acid, it gives off a gas. So what I should see is bubbles of gas and the piece of magnesium disappears or becomes small. Propanoic acid reacts with methanol to form an ester. We know that acid plus alcohol gives ester. Give the name of a catalyst for this reaction. What is the catalyst for formation of an ester? You should know the catalyst is concentrated sulfuric acid. What is the structural formula of the ester? How do I draw an ester? Could you follow? We look at the acid first. Which acid are we reacting? We are starting with propanoic acid. So this is acid with three carbons and C double bond O, O, H at the end. So that is propanoic acid. I want to react it with methanol. How do we draw methanol? Methanol is something that has one carbon and an OH. Now, we need to join these together to form an ester. How do we join them to form an ester? When we react acid with alcohol, remove the OH of the acid, the H of the alcohol, and join directly from the carbon of the acid to the oxygen of the alcohol. Following? So, if we do this, this becomes our ester. So, which of the choices is this? If you look at all the choices, you will find that this is the cor correct answer. CH3, CH2, COO, CH3. So, that is my ester. A polyester can be made by reacting ethane dioic acid with ethane diol. These are the displayed formula of the two reactants give the name of this type of polymerization. When I make polymers, we said there are two types of polymers. I can either be starting with an alkene, and that is addition, or I could be starting with something like this, in which I have a diacid and a dialcohol, 
to join them together to form a polymer. This is called condensation polymerization. Now, give the name of the other product of this reaction. So, if I am reacting this together, what did we say we, we need to do? We need to remove OH from the acid, H from the alcohol, that forms water, H2O. Draw the displayed formula for the repeat unit of the polyester foods. To draw the repeat unit of the polymer. Remove OH from acid, H from alcohol, and join directly so that this would be our repeat unit that is repeated many, many times. You can draw it with the bracket and the N or without the bracket and the N. State what is meant by the term biopolyester. Of course, biopolyester means a polyester that is biodegradable or a polymer that can be broken down by bacteria. Question 6 says the diagram shows two pieces of apparatus used in titration. Give the names of these pieces. Of course, you should realize that X is pipette. Please be careful with spelling. Y is burette. Y is something with a tap. And graduations, it's a burette. If it were without graduations, then it would be a dropping final. Give the name of a suitable indicator that can be used in an acid alkali titration. We said what kind of indicators can we use in a titration? You can use either phenolphthalene or methyl orange. Again, be careful with spelling. A student does a titration using sodium carbonate solution and dilute nitric acid. This is the equation for the reaction. The table shows the concentrations of the two solutions and the volume of sodium carbonate used in the titration. Use the equation and the data to answer these questions. Calculate the volume of dilute nitric acid that the students would need to neutralize sodium carbonate solution. So, we have concentration of sodium carbonate. We have volume of sodium carbonate. I can use that to get number of moles. Number of moles of sodium carbonate is concentration times volume. Please do not forget that volume in centimeter cubed, you will have to divide it by a thousand before putting it into this equation. The volume should be in decimeter cubed. So this is the number of moles of sodium carbonate. That's my first step. Now, what are we asked about? We are asked to get the volume of what? Nitric acid, I look at the equation and relate the number of moles. The equation says if I have one mole of sodium carbonate, it reacts with two moles of nitric acid. That means number of moles of nitric acid should be twice that of sodium carbonate. So number of moles of acid is that multiplied by two. Now I have number of moles of acid. What am I asked about? Volume of acid. How do we get volume of acid? Volume of acid is number of moles over concentration so number of moles we got and the concentration we're given in the table this gives me the volume in decimeter cubed we want it in centimeter cubed you multiply by a thousand Then the question says, calculate the volume in centimeter cubed of carbon dioxide gas that would be produced from 25 centimeter cubed of sodium carbonate solution. So we're still talking about this same equation and we already got from the previous question that the number of moles of sodium carbonate is this. Now we need to use it to get what? Volume of carbon dioxide. So, we have number of moles of sodium carbonate. Now, we look at the equation, relate the number of moles. From the equation, you can see 
the number of moles of sodium carbonate is the same as CO2. So number of moles of carbon dioxide is the same. Now we need to get volume of a gas at room temperature and pressure. Volume of a gas we get from the number of moles times 24, but we need it in centimeter cubed, so we need to multiply that by 1000. So this comes out to 132 centimeter cubed. Describe a test to show that sodium carbonate solution contains carbonate ions. What is test for carbonate? Yes, add dilute hydrochloric acid. Bubbles of gas are formed that turn lime water milky. Please remember the tests. Test for carbonate, I add acid. I get bubbles of gas that turn lime water milky. Sodium chloride is an ionic compound. Explain why sodium chloride conducts electricity when it is molten or in solution, but not when it is a solid. So, sodium chloride is ionic. That means it is a giant three-dimensional structure of alternating positive and negative ions. So, as a solid, the ions... Please remember we're talking about ions, not electrons. Ionic compound has ions. So as a solid, the ions are fixed in a giant three-dimensional crystal lattice, so they cannot conduct electricity. But when molten or in solution, the ions are free to move, so they conduct electricity. A solution of sodium chloride can be electrolyzed using this apparatus. So we have sodium chloride solution. If the solution is dilute, a significant amount of oxygen collects at P. Complete the ionic half equation for this reaction. So we are given the ionic half equation. All we need to do is balance. So how many oxygens after the arrow? We have two oxygens after the arrow, so I need two before the arrow. But that means that now I have four hydrogens before the arrow. That means I need four H+. Plus. That means I have four positives, so I need four negatives. So I put four in front of the electrons. If the solution is concentrated, chlorine is the main product that collects at P. This is the ionic half equation. State why this is an oxidation reaction. Why is this an oxidation reaction? Of course, because the chloride ions lost electrons or because it involves the loss of electrons. Remember, loss of electrons is oxidation. The gas that collects at Q is hydrogen give a test for hydrogen. What is the test for hydrogen? Insert a lighted splint, it pops. Remember, lighted, not glowing. Insert a lighted splint, it pops. Explain how hydrogen gas forms at the negative electrode. Where did the hydrogen gas come from? Remember that in solution, we have H plus ions and chloride ions and Na plus ions. But the ones that react at the cathode is the H plus. Now, what happens is the H plus ions are positive. So they are attracted to the negative electrode, which is the cathode. Now, they go to the electrode and do what? The positive ions go to the cathode to gain electrons and form atoms. Now the hydrogen atoms combine together to form hydrogen molecules. Hydrogen reacts with oxygen to form water and we're given the equation. The table gives bond energies. Use the equation and the values in the table to calculate the enthalpy change for the reaction. 
Remember, delta H is reactants minus products. So what do we have in the reactants? We have two HH bonds, so that's 2 times 4, 3, 6, plus an oxygen-oxygen bond, so that's 4, 9, 8. Minus the products. What do we have in the products? We have four bonds of OH, 2 times 2 of OH bonds, so the overall delta H is minus, and please make sure you write the sign. If it comes out to be positive, please write the positive. It must have a sign. So here it comes out negative, so this is minus 4A2. Complete the diagram to show the energy levels of the reactants and products and delta H. Again, you realize that we said this reaction, the delta H came out negative. Negative means it's exothermic. That means reactants have more energy than products. You write the uh, reactants and products from the equation. We have two hydrogen plus oxygen as reactants to form two water and the difference in energy from reactants to products, that is the delta H. And that was the last question in the paper. I hope you understand this explanation and good luck in your exams. Thank you for listening.